Good afternoon. I'm John Bitson, the Menard Family Director of the Sheila and Robert Challey Institute for Global Innovation and Growth. Welcome to the Menard Family Distinguished Speaker Series. I'm really excited today that we're joined by Dr. Robert Koopman, Chief Economist at the World Trade Organization. He has a wealth of knowledge of international trade and international trade policy issues and the effects on economic growth and economic development. We're all gonna learn a lot today. His presentation today is going to be on the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic on the potential future of globalization and integration. And I think that this is a really important issue for us to talk about today because a lot of the increase in opportunity and prosperity that we realize today is a result of globalization and increased intertwined economies. So I'm really excited to hear from Dr. Koopman about his perspectives on this issue. We have more than 350 people registered for this event today. And so you'll have an opportunity to ask Dr. Koopman a question yourself. So at any time, if you have a question for Dr. Koopman, please leave it in the Q&A feature of Zoom. Don't use the chat, but use the Q&A feature of Zoom. We're really grateful to all of our donors, the Menard family and all of our donors for making this series possible and for making all of these events possible. This is a really great opportunity for us to interact with internationally renowned thought leaders. And this is a really great example for us to think about an issue and engage in a really important issue like we're talking about today. Uh, without any further delay, I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Robert Koopman. Bob Koopman is currently Chief Economist of the World Trade Organization and an adjunct professor of international economics at the Graduate Institute in Geneva, Switzerland. At the WTO, Bob serves as Chief Economic Counselor to the Director General and provides the WTO Secretariat and member countries with analysis and information that promotes a deeper understanding of trade and trade policy's role in economic growth and development. At the Graduate Institute, Bob teaches courses in international trade. Bob also serves as a WTO representative to the G20 Trade and Investment Working Group and the G20 Framework Group. He is a research associate of CEPR London and an editor of the Springer series on advances in applied general equilibrium modeling. Prior to joining the WTO and the Graduate Institute, Bob was Chief Operating Officer at the U.S. International Trade Commission and an Adjunct Professor of Economics at Georgetown University. Bob has also previously served as Chief Economist at U.S. International Trade Commission, Deputy Administrator for Social Sciences at what is now the National Institute for Food and Agriculture in USDA, and various leadership and analyst positions at the Economic Research Service of USDA. And a special thanks to Bob for being with us tonight. And you might wonder, why am I saying tonight? It's three o'clock in the afternoon, but Bob is joining us from Geneva, Switzerland, where it's 10 o'clock after 10 o'clock in the evening. And so thanks for staying awake for us tonight, Bob, and thanks for being with us. It's a very special effort on your part. I know that you're very busy this week with a lot of issues related to the vaccine uh, distribution worldwide and other issues. And so I really appreciate you taking the time to be with us tonight. And it's really an honor to be able to hear from you and to be able to talk to you. So welcome, Bob, and, and thanks again for staying awake for us. Well, thank you, John. Um, yeah, you know, it's like, uh, what is it uh, when you turn 60? Um, nine o'clock is the new midnight. So I'm <laughs> burning the midnight oil here. Uh, it's a pleasure to to be joining you. Sorry, I can't be there um, in person in North Dakota. Uh, I was in Fargo uh, many years ago when I was with USDA and uh, would, would love to get back there someday. But tonight, uh, I'm going to talk to you about uh, COVID and implications for the future of globalization and integration. And John, as you said, you know, a lot of the... Um, uh, I guess more dynamic developments and opportunities come have come about as a result of globalization and um, uh, COVID and uh, recent uh, um, trade policy developments in the last say four or five years have uh, really brought um, some shocks to the system. So I'm going to talk about some of those tonight, but with a with an emphasis on um, COVID. So if you don't mind, I'm going to share my slides. Um, and hopefully this will work. And there we go. 
Um, so just got to make sure I lost my cursor. <laughs> Well, that works. Oh, there we go. There's a delay, I guess. Okay. Apologies for that. Okay. So COVID-19, it's been a dramatic global shock for both the macroeconomic and the trade outlook. Uh, recently, the IMF released its World Economic Outlook, um, which is projecting um, a recovery in the global economy for this coming year. Um, but last year, it, it, it found a 3.3% decline in GDP, worldwide GDP in 2020, which interestingly was revised upward throughout the year. So they had much more uh, negative expectations about a year ago, as did we at the WTO around trade. Um, but um, things have turned out to be less bad than expected, both for GDP and trade. Um, and they're expecting a recovery of global GDP at about 6% for 2021, and then slowing down to 4.4% in 2022. A big driver of the recovery has been the $16 trillion in fiscal support, largely by advanced economies, and extensive liquidity provision, which has been very important for global trade, which has been about equivalent to another $10 trillion um, of support. So those are, those are pretty big numbers, <laughs> never seen before. And certainly a year ago, we would not have been expecting those. Um, we would have expected something much closer to what we saw in the great financial crisis of 2008, 2009, which were less than a quarter of these kinds of, uh, of numbers. So we had this great uh, significant uh, government intervention both in fiscal and uh, monetary policy, but there's still a great deal of uncertainty in the global economy. And uh, in this chart on the right-hand side of this slide, but the left-hand corner of that right-hand side, you see uh, world GDP. This is an OECD projection. And you'll see an orange line, that's their baseline case. And then you'll see a green dotted line and a blue dotted line. The green dotted line is their optimistic scenario the blue dotted line is their pessimistic scenario. And the scenarios, the pessimism and optimism had to do with the ability of health policies to deal with um, the uh, virus spread. So if things go well and there's widespread vaccination and vaccinations are effective at dealing with mutations, um, then we expect uh, a positive boost from that uh, stimulating growth about another two, two and a half percent. If things don't go well, vaccinations roll out slowly or vaccines are ineffective against the, uh, the mutations, then we'll see um, a percentage point or so taken off of global growth. So speed of vaccinations, their effectiveness, very, very important. Um, and there's been a lot of investment in, do in trying to uh, speed both production and distribution and delivery of vaccines. And tomorrow at the WTO, we're having a big workshop on this where we hear from private sector producers uh, around the challenges that they're finding in global supply chains to expand production and uh, have effective distribution. So about a year ago, uh, the WTO, uh, that was us, me in particular, uh, and my team, we expected a significant decline in global trade for 2020 and a slow recovery for 2021. We had optimistic and pessimistic scenarios uh, that showed trade falling well below trend. And we were predicting anywhere from a 12 to a 32% decline in the volume of merchandise trade with a recovery in 2021 in the pessimistic scenario remaining well below previous trend in the optimistic scenario, getting close to trend from 19, uh, I'm sorry, from 2011 to 2018. On the left-hand side here, uh, I don't know if you can see this, but you see uh, this blue dotted line. That was the trend in merchandise trade between 1990 and 2008. And you can see since 2008, merchandise trade uh, trend 
has been much slower. And I'll talk about some of that, um, some of the driving factors. The main point here is this was really unusual. Okay, that was a very unusual burst of globalization, the trend that, that came from this period back here. Um, a number of forces aligned to make that happen. So again, about a year ago, uh, we saw the biggest declines in GDP and trade in decades. So the red stuff is what I added. The, 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 the stuff in black on these slides were what I was saying a year ago. So biggest declines in GDP and trade in decades. Both were true, but not as big as expected. And the trade to GDP relationship turned out to be very different compared to what we observed in, say, the great financial crisis. In the great financial crisis, trade declined about six times more than GDP um, declined. In this crisis, trade has only declined about twice as much as the D GDP decline. And I would argue that that's largely because of the liquidity provisions and the extensive fiscal support. So um, I was worried about a weak recovery a year ago, particularly if there was um, scarring for uh, consumers and businesses, if they uh, were reluctant to consume and invest. Um, there's still uncertainty around this, but clearly there's been mitigating effect, effects from the fiscal policy support, monetary policy support, but also unexpected, well, not so much unexpectedly, some of our models showed this a year ago. Um, there was consumption shifting away from proximity related services to goods. So tradable goods got uh, some sort of spillover benefits since people couldn't go out to dinner, they couldn't go to movies, they couldn't go to shows, they couldn't go on vacations. They shifted um, a fair amount of that expenditures into goods, things that they could actually purchase um, businesses shifted to online delivery, online ordering, facilitated that. So there was this pretty big consumption shift, uh, and that helped mitigate some of the negative effects. But, and there's been an accumulation of savings by consumers. Business investment has been weak, could remain weak, we'll see. Um, but I expect as we open up to see a big burst of demand from consumers who have, have increased their savings, but I would expect that to peter out and be a one-shot deal, and we'll see a shift back towards those proximity-related service consumptions, um, and people make up for lost vacations. So um, I was really worried that if government policies were not large enough or structurally ineffective at dealing with demand and liquidity issues, that the recovery would be weak. But instead, what we've seen is that the, the support's been strong enough, certainly, um, and it's been reasonably effective thus far. So uh, lots of lessons learned from the great financial crisis. Um, not enough support, um, not necessarily well-designed. We're bailing out banks instead of bailing out um, households and supporting, um, and supporting wages, and we've seen uh, quite a bit of learning both in the United States and Europe and other countries around that. Now in trade, I expected a big impact on trade from decreased consumption and investment, but also from increased trade costs. Um, investment is probably of the components of GDP demand, investment is the most trade intensive other than exports. Um, and weak investment is typically associated with weak trade growth. And I would argue when we go back, if we went back to those trend growth slides, that one of the reasons we've been well below trend for, uh, from compared to the 1990s to mid 2000s is because we've had relatively weak investment since the great financial crisis. So we had decreased consumption, yes, but it was a shift from proximity related services to manufactured goods. Investments remained weak. Um, it's gotten even weaker than what we observed in the prior period, um, but it very well could recover uh, we'll have to see. That's a very difficult thing to predict. Trade costs have risen. They continue to rise, particularly around the imbalance of containers around the world uh, and uh, choke points at ports and things like that. But we expect those costs to fall and return to long-term normal trend. Um, we were worried about the labor shock from reduced labor participation if health issues couldn't be resolved. Um, they, we've, what we've seen is mitigating efforts by both governments, firms, and households 
and uh, because capital and infrastructure was not damaged, um, we've seen the effect, although the mitigation uh, impacts have um, helped limit those negative effects. So they weren't as bad as we thought. Okay, so now what do we see as of right now? As I said, uh, our central forecast for trade growth is for 8% growth in merchandise trade volume for 2021, slowing back down to about 4% in 2022. There's an upside scenario if we see um, effective vaccines and effective rollout, we could see trade growth up to 10.5%. In the downside scenario, we could say you see trade growth falling to about 6%. As I said, this is much smaller uh, trade impacts compared to GDP, compared to what we saw in the great financial crisis. Um, and interestingly, trade growth plummeted in the first half of 2020, but recovered very strongly in the third and fourth quarters of 2020. Trade in medical goods was very strong. Trade in agricultural goods was steady very critical there, two critical goods for sustaining um, um, well-being, uh, medical goods and agricultural goods. Uh, medical goods trade skyrocketed, uh, well, increased significantly, and trade in agricultural goods was very, very steady. And what we, one thing we observed was trade in, in global value chains were relatively resilient. Trade in services very badly hit by the pandemic, Services requiring personal interaction, interaction were strongly negatively affected, but there were some uptick in services such as IT, the kinds of things we're using tonight. Um, here's a, a quick picture of what happened to trade in medical goods, up 16.3% for the year. Uh, that was uh, about uh, three to four times what we saw in 2019 compared to 2018. So it was a big increase in trade with a big, big increase in medical supplies and even bigger increase in personal protective ma uh, products, all those masks that everybody's been wearing. Um, lots of trade in that really helped with uh, mitigating efforts and also with therapeutics and helping in the recovery from uh, the uh, effects of the virus. Here's some example of what happened in the quarters uh, um, total merchandise trade was down 21% in the second quarter, made our projections early in the year look like they might come, uh, come to uh, fruition. But instead, all the mitigation efforts, the, uh, the fiscal monetary policies really did stimulate demand, uh, household behavior, uh, producer behavior. So we saw trade decline only 6% in the um, third quarter but had essentially recovered total merchandise trade had recovered to 2019 levels by the fourth quarter. You can see uh, fuel and mining products doing very, very poorly. A lot of that is price effects, uh, agricultural products doing well um, and manufacturers recovering reasonably well. Um, this gives you an idea. There's this thing called AMOS, the Agricultural Market Information System, which looks at uh, food security critical products, maize, rice, soybean, and wheat. And you can see that throughout 2020, um, uh, trade and um, in those core products remained very, very steady, helping with food security. Services, no trade recovery in sight, really. You can see travel and transport uh, being very adversely affected. Other business services and some goods related services did reasonably well, but uh, until there's widespread vaccinations or something like vaccine passports, we expect those, uh, those elements of services to perform relatively poorly. The recovery in trade's been pretty uneven though. Um, you can see that, um, Asia, this is Asia here. Asia exports have been very, very strong. North American imports um, have been reasonably strong. This imbalance is uh, of concern to us uh, with the strong growth in um, Europe and North American imports largely driving exports from Asia. That's a lot of the spillover from that fiscal and monetary policy contributing to imbalances. And a concern I have here is that it could contribute to 
uh, growing trade tensions if Asia does not start to increase its imports, particularly of capital and final consumer goods. Most of the COVID-19 trade-related trade measures that were taken were in WTO terminology, um, targeted, transparent, and temporary. So we've seen um, most measures related to trade restrictions already removed, about 58% uh, of trade restriction measures have been removed. Many measures to begin with were trade facilitating, only 42% were restricting trade, but more measures were about facilitating trade. And of these trade restricting measures, uh, many of them have been removed. Um, and 39% of the COVID-19 restrictions in and of themselves have been removed. Um, so from a trade policy perspective, that's, uh, those are some reasonably positive developments. And I'll come back to this when I talk about globalization and integration and particularly the role of the WTO in that. Now, here's an assessment of the uh, impact of um, a stronger dollar and the US stimulus boost. You can see that countries that have benefited include Mexico and China, two big trading partners, but a fair amount of spillover also for the UK and Mexico. Some European countries have benefited and some, um, South American countries have not benefited. They've been adversely affected by um, the stimulus in the US. Um, now, there have been big gains to exporters, as I mentioned, and uh, some countries like uh, Mexico and Chile um, have benefited. Brazil can stand to benefit through indirect exports working through China. So um, where is China? China here, if you look, you can see that China will have some uh, pretty big ex, uh, indirect effects on emerging economies. And much of these exports from Brazil and Chile are actually uh, working through um, manufactured exports from China coming uh, to the United States. Mexico's uh, exports are largely direct and their benefits um, are, are direct, they're benefiting directly from the US stimulus programs. So what does it take to develop, produce and distribute vaccines? Because it turns out that they're pretty important to the recovery, as I said, they contribute to these positive and negative scenarios. Um, we've created this graphic that basically shows from vaccine development all the way through to domestic uh, distribution and surveillance. There's lots of steps where activities touch upon borders or relate to WTO commitments. Um, uh, some of this goes to our trade related uh, uh, intellectual property rights. Um, some of it's simply tariffs, some of it's regulatory coherence, non-discrimination uh, that's expected in the WTO where you treat imported goods the same as you treat domestic goods. Um, so there's a lot of stages here. You can see things where things are crossing borders. Um, you can also get export prohibitions. You can get things like problems with uh, domestic distribution and the ability, inability of goods, uh, vaccines, which are complicated goods to produce uh, to cross borders. Uh, if you're shipping a vaccine, you need to have cold storage. You need to have very careful uh, transportation of the goods. Lots of places where R&D is occurring across, uh, across the globe. Uh, in much of my travels over the last six years, I have visited um, a series of R&D efforts that are essentially um, 24 seven, 365 days a year where there are uh, research facilities in New York state, in California, in China, in India, in Europe, and then back to New York. And it's uh, the, um, the R&D is being handed off as one lab shuts down, it goes to the next. I mean, this is pretty amazing stuff when you look at it. It's pharmaceuticals, it's IT, 
its manufacturing. Um, it's, it's pretty amazing. So this is a very globalized, integrated world. Um, and um, trade plays an important part. When you think about R&D, sometimes it's people moving across borders, but often it's digital. It's, it's data moving across borders. And there are potentially very big challenges around data moving across borders as we go forward. And that's a big challenge to, put to the potential future integration. So what might a post COVID world look like um, from a global integration perspective? Well, I'm gonna argue that I don't see deglobalization. There are some people who are like, oh, we're gonna have deglobalization. No, we're gonna have what I think is reglobalization where we get a reorganization of globalization. There are some forces that are definitely changing. There are some longer term trends and there are some new, newer forces. I mentioned that I don't expect us to recover to the rapid growth uh, in trades, in goods trade that we saw from 1990 to 2005 where trade grew twice as fast as GDP growth. And that's because those were very special circumstances. Um, that was India, the European centrally planned economies and China opening up. At the same time, we had massive liberalization through the Uruguay round. We had unilateral liberalization from joining the WTO or just unilateral liberalizations as countries reformed. We had regional integration. Lots of things contributed to that very fast uh, growth in trade. Um, which was, by the way, driven a lot by foreign direct investment flowing to these countries that had been previously closed off. That foreign direct investment flows were facilitated by all these agreements, either unilateral liberalization, regional or multilateral uh, trade agreements and investment agreements. But much of that has been accomplished. And so what I expect is us to go back to this long-term growth from 1865 to present, which is about 1.4 times. Um, trade grows about 1.4 times faster than income growth. But I see, I think we'll see some compositional changes. We're gonna see a lot more digital cross-border trade. We're gonna see a diversification in supply chain sourcing. This was happening before the previous US administration, but the previous US administration brought more uncertainty around tariffs and traditional trade policies that uh, caused even more um, search for diversified sources of, um, of inputs, parts, and components. It was a trend that we were already observing and um, that sped it up. And so I think what we'll see is less dependence on China and more diversified spread across other countries. Actually, I would argue that um, up to China's WTO accession in 2001, you recall there was something called NAFTA and Mexico's economic development strategy was essentially to be an offshore production platform for um, serving the US market as well as the European market and South America market integration. China's rise essentially took a lot of the wind out of the sail of Mexico's uh, economic development strategy. Um, if you look at China's export vectors, they're pretty much in the same vectors that Mexico had planned on building out. Now, Mexico still did reasonably well, but it would have done better, as would have Vietnam, Malaysia, Indonesia, had China not uh, been this concentrated source of, um, of, of supply chain sourcing. I also expect to see more automation and production and supply chain steps, more flexible production processes. And what do I mean by that? Um, the ability of um, countries and companies to flip to the production of goods and services for which there might be an unexpected spike in demand, such as medical products, okay? Um, it could be carbon neutral products, non-carbon non based production, um, lots of different products for which there might be spikes in demand 
and uh, governments and businesses thinking about how to build their production processes to be much more flexible as opposed to being fixed. But this is what really is still gonna drive much of globalization and integration. Adam Smith's insights on specialization, economies of scale, efficiency and production, and David Ricardo's comparative advantage forces, I'm sorry, I just don't see them going away. There might be some rebalancing of them, particularly as firms start to change weights and values around risk versus efficiency, but those efficiencies are still there. If you listen to all the consulting firms, McKinsey, Deloitte, you know, firms are still looking for efficiency. They're always gonna look for efficiency. Some of the new US administration's efforts in investing in infrastructure and R&D and those kinds of things might bring some of those efficiency gains back to the United States. Um, but keep in mind that those kinds of advancements are always occurring globally um, and they're distributed in an in economic gravity world. Uh, you worry about domestic costs versus uh, international costs and changing uh, array of international costs. It's, um, it's a, a gravity environment that's always changing. But these forces are going to remain. They're not going to go away. So, you know, uh, I've already said much of this. Firms, not only will businesses, but governments and households are going to have to evaluate this risk versus efficiency trade-off. For firms, they're going to think about things like inventories. They'll probably reduce some of their just-in-time and hold larger inventories. Uh, they'll diversify their supply chains. They'll do more automation around production to limit their, uh, the adverse effect of health impacts that might reduce the labor force. Um, they'll also rely more on digitization. And as I said, it's this risk versus efficiency calculation for them. Governments are gonna have to learn how to manage for demand spikes above average supply. I believe they'll focus more. They'd already planned and done some planning around emergency stockpiling. Um, but they took their eye off the ball, I think. Not just the US, but many governments. You know, if it's not a pressing problem right now, you forget about it. Well, I think for at least uh, five or 10 years, the COVID-19 pandemic is gonna get, concentrate the mind wonderfully and get governments to think about how to manage emergency stockpiles, but in ways that taxpayers and citizens can afford and accept which means they have to think about the role for trade because that brings you a lot of these efficiency, low cost uh, ways to manage your emergency stockpiles, as well as think about these the, the flexible domestic production arrangements and international insurance agreements. Households are gonna have to think about how to um, effectively get remote work, access critical services, education, healthcare, as well as purchase necessary products. So there'll be some of these changes but I don't think they're gonna have significantly negative impacts on integration. You're gonna see a change in how integration occurs. Okay, now I'm gonna transition a little bit to um, sort of the economics and politics of integration. So there's always a political aspect to integration. Uh, and by the way, much of what I'm saying, I, I haven't emphasized this, but since I'm talking to a US audience and I did work for USDA, including um, doing social sciences with land grant universities and looking at rural development, the kinds of things we see happening in the world, moving things across countries, as a trade economist, I'm much more actually uh, sort of an economic geographer the same kinds of things you see happening globally happen within a country. So I grew up in the Northeast in a mill town um, in New Hampshire that lost its textile production to the Carolinas and its shoe production um, to Asia. Um, and eventually the Carolinas lost much of their textile and apparel production to Asia. Um, Detroit's lost a lot of automobile production to um, Kentucky and Tennessee, not just to um, Mexico. So you, you see um, these kinds of economic geography effects occurring regularly. Um, so I just want to make the case that some of the challenges you see globally 
um, are also uh, forces that play out domestically. Okay, but let's talk about geopolitics rather than uh, subnational politics in the United States. Um, so the, the global trading systems has always been influenced by geopolitics. And this goes back to like imperial preferences, the international trade organization, the, the thing that didn't get created or implemented prior to the GATT in 1947. The GATT, um, which was a club of countries, a uh, small group of countries that decided to take uh, integration forward, eventually expanding and morphing in 1995 into the World Trade Organization. Finally, the realization of the ITO, but with a slightly different name. These are all influenced by changing geopolitical circumstances within and across countries. And WTO reform, um, which is important for the future of integration, will also be informed by these kinds of political changes. Um, and there's a lot happening right now politically. Economics-wise, um, the system has been influenced by changing economic power, um, but also more importantly, things like economic forces and economic concepts. Economic forces like technological change, um, moving from agriculture to industry, to servicification, to digitalization. These are big economic forces that um, have disruptive effects on the global economy, but also domestic economies. Then there are big concepts, as I mentioned, Smithian specialization and Ricardian comparative advantage, uh, Paul Krugman two-way trade. Um, why do countries with the same kinds of technological um, uh, level and endowment of factors trade? Well, because we like different kinds of goods, uh, variety in our goods. And then there are intermediate concepts such as uh, free trade, import substitution industrialization or export led um, industrialization and economic development. So you can have a free trade view of economic growth and development. You could follow the old import substitution industrialization largely discredited, though some countries still seem to believe in it. And then you can have export led economic growth, which is what my, many of the Asian tigers, Japan uh, and um, China have done. And then you get to much more uh, sort of specific concepts, things like, well, when are we going to define tariffs? Will they be specific or ad valorem? Will we reduce tariffs? Um, what about quotas? How do we deal with regulatory coherence? And then there are these uh, underlying principles, MFN, national treatment, non-discrimination. All of these are, are concepts and forces that deal with the multilateral trading system and something like the WTO. And then you bring in the lawyers, you know, uh, uh, there are more lawyers at the WTO than economists. And many people think that's a mistake. In the GATT, there were more economists than lawyers, uh, supposedly, that's what I'm told. Um, but um, lawyers take these economic concepts and political compromises and write them into a contract. And then you get things like mechanism design is, um, you know, what is, is, is the uh, contract fixed? Is it flexible? Um, is there a regulatory sandbox like in the IT area? Uh, is it easily adaptable? What kind of legal framework do you use to interpret these words? What do the words mean? Um, uh, one of the phrases you often hear at the WTO and I hear it regularly, I don't use it as an economist, but is constructive ambiguity. In other words, we can agree on these words to these words, and we have different interpretations of what they mean, but you know, we get an agreement. Um, and then later on, those differences in what those words mean uh, uh, turn out to mean a lot. And will you find a political solution to those differences, or will you bring a legal case? Um, I would argue you want more political solution when you had um, constructive ambiguity than trying to ask some judges to sort it out for you. So I would argue that the WTO is held up reasonably well. 
um, both in the great financial crisis and the great lockdown. There are some out there who say, look at all the growing protectionism. Look, I can count all these measures. I can tell you that when we look at implicit trade costs, all these measures don't seem to be having a very big impact on, uh, on trade costs. Um, clearly, there are some places where they matter, and they do matter, um, but they're largely being offset by um, technology costs being continuously driven down. And it would be good to get further liberalization, but uh, we don't really see, um, other than the previous US administration dramatically changing trade costs with countries like China and, and some products with other countries, um, we don't see trade costs going up very dramatically. And keep in mind, tariffs represent only a small share of overall trade costs. Members are clearly worried about how their policy actions would be viewed by others and their consistency with WTO obligations. So the foundation of the system seems to be working. Members are concerned they have obligations. They seem to be trying to meet them. And even under the previous US administration, when they imposed these um, unusual measures, they tried to cast them in a way that would be WTO com compliant. So we see restrained behavior and uh, concerns about what the commitments are. What we've seen so far is more trade diversion. So this reorganization or realignment of global and regional value chains, rather than uh, significant declines in global trade and we've seen real, no real evidence of reshoring. So it's really hard to find reshoring in the data. You may see some nearshoring, but you don't see a lot of reshoring. And you can come up with uh, examples here and there, but that's what they are. They're just sort of examples. You don't see it in the data. But there's definitely a need for reform, uh, tune up and updating of the system to deal with some of these big changes going on in geopolitics um, and uh, economic power. Um, since the WTO Uruguay round commitments, the rise of China and other developing countries has been very, very significant. Trade has helped um, take billions of people out of poverty. Even if you set China aside, trade has been the biggest driving force in reducing poverty. Not all of that increase in trade has been because of reductions in tariff, uh, tariff costs or trade costs. Much of it's been because of good uh, um, uh, reform of domestic policies. But we've seen a global long-term fall in, glo in tariffs, but we see bilateral US-China tariffs moving to levels we've not seen in a long time big global imbalances. I talked about some of the spillover effects. Most of those have to do with macro finance policies. Very few have to do with liberalization. You talk to the average trade economist and they're gonna tell you that your trade deficits got to do with savings and investment, not got to do with bilateral tariffs with any particular country. Those tariffs can adjust the composition of that, uh, that deficit but it's largely driven by savings and investment. There are some unique challenges for the United States and I'll get into those if I get a chance. Um, but if you look at GVCs, global value chains and value added trade data, you see that the big bilateral deficit with China is actually still a significant, if you reallocate like, like this iPhone here, right? So it's supposedly made in China, but it's made of, it's assembled in China with parts largely made in Korea, Malaysia, Indonesia, the United States, Europe, um, and very little of its final value is actually generated in China. Although in increasing shares are, they're moving up the value chain, little doubt. So what's the role of subsidies, currencies, forced technology transfer? Um, I would argue that they're, you know, they, they affect the composition of your bilateral deficits, um, but not your overall deficit, at least not very much. Currency may have had some impact, but not, not uh, certainly not the majority of it. Uh, in fact, a very small minority of it. Infrastructure, long-term investment, R&D, reducing trade costs, uh, raising productivity, those things are likely to have bigger impact on level playing field issues than, than subsidies. Um, now, specific sectors, 
definite problems, okay? Specific countries, definite problems, but overall it's really not driving um, uh, the global imbalances. So um, I'd also argue that you have to pay attention. So this infrastructure, long-term investment, R&D, reducing trade costs, raising productivity, China's done a lot of that. It's done some subsidies for sure. It's also manipulated its currency, but, and it's done some of this forced technology transfer, but it's done an awful lot of this kind of stuff, okay? Um, and one thing that I've observed with trade negotiators is they tend to be looking at the right now or the recent past. They're not looking ahead. And if we know anything about the global economy, is that comparative advantage changes. So if you think the US should have a comparative advantage in steel production, that was probably from the 1940s through the 1960s. Um, the rest of the world got much better at producing steel. Yes, China probably provides subsidies to steel and aluminum um, in pretty clever ways, but it doesn't explain um, the overall change in technology. In fact, within the United States, there's been a technological shift in steel production, uh, largely moving from, uh, what are they called, integrated blast furnace type, type plants um, to electric arc furnaces and melting scrap. That was a huge innovation that disrupted the domestic steel market um, and also uh, big improvements of labor productivity that reduced demand for steel workers. So now, interestingly enough, we see change in comparative advantage. If countries are converging to a similar technology, if you think about Ricardian gains from trade, then the gains from trade get smaller as countries get more alike in terms of technology. There's less leveraging the differences in productivity to get bigger gains from trade. Now, Levchenko and Zhang says that there's been um, a, a convergence, whereas Hansen et al, uh, looking at the dynamics of comparative advantage says, there's change in comparative advantages, but we always see uh, a big distribution or a, a relatively con constant um, distribution of differences in comparative advantage. So there are still pretty big gains from trade. These are empirical questions that I think warrant further investigation. This is just some data to show what's happening to global tariffs. You can see global tariffs have fallen. Um, on the left-hand side, we have advanced economies. Average tariffs in advanced economies have fallen to about 4%. They remain at about 12% in emerging and developing countries. On the right-hand side is some data from the Peterson Institute, Chad Baum that shows what's happened to US-China bilateral tariffs. Um, US tariffs have gone from about 3.1% to over 20% on average Chinese imports. So pretty significant uh, increases in tariffs. Um, we still have a huge bilateral trade deficit with China, um, but most of the impact of these raising tariffs has been to shift, create trade diversion with dramatic increases in imports from other countries such as Taiwan, Vietnam, uh, Japan. Um, imports from China have plunged, but imports from other countries have increased dramatically. Um, and this is some modeling work that we did at the WTO back when the trade conflict started. And what we predicted was significant trade diversion. This is data from what's actually happened. And we see significant trade diversion. Um, let's see. You can see over time uh, changing global imbalances. Um, and I would argue that this is largely savings and investment with supply and demand side policies affecting the composition um, and that there's been some value chain adjustments. Um, so level playing fields, is, uh, is it natural or is it a bad design? Um, if you're not investing in your infrastructure, you're raising your trade costs, okay? Um, so I would argue that the new US administration desire to invest 
in infrastructure is a good thing. It'll help level the playing field. Um, the lack of investment has probably resulted in an unlevel playing field to some extent. I'm not saying it's the, the total driver, okay? But um, another element is uh, investment in research and development. Much of the technology we're using right now today is the result of R&D that the US government funded in the 1960s and 1970s. And this technology that, that we use today came out from that R&D decades ago. Um, overall, R&D in the United States has stayed quite steady. The federal government's share in fundamental R&D has declined, and it's been replaced um, over the last 20 years by pharma R&D and uh, IT R&D by big IT firms. And they're not necessarily developing new breakthrough technologies. They're often developing uh, technologies that will bring um, increased profits in the marketplace. Not a bad thing. I'm not complaining about that at all. But you need to find the right balance between fundamental new ideas, many of which don't work, but the few that do often have very big high rates of return. Actually, a school like NDSU, agricultural investment has been characterized by this kind of uh, fundamental R&D that's helped transform our agriculture from labor intensive to very capital intensive um, and highly productive. Now, the future is not likely to look like the past. So uh, I've done some work looking at China going into the future. If China successfully rebalances from um, investment and uh, manufacturing led to consumption and services led, which is what the Chinese government says its goal is, okay? If that happens, real private household consumption in China would increase dramatically from this trend, these trends down here to this trend up there. And that would result in China's net exports to the world falling significantly um, and uh, bilateral uh, deficits going, um, well, not necessarily going away, but becoming much less of a bilateral issue. Um, so government policy is industrial policy, whether it's explicit or not. Um, there's a big debate over this. Justin Lin talks about pro-comparative advantage. He's one of the architects of China's rise. Danny Roderick argues that the government should be leveling the playing field by looking at things like social dumping. Mariana Matsukato talks about mission-led intervention, solve large social problems by working with the private sector. Uh, Alan Sykes talks about, uh, his is an older paper, but any intervention, whether it's tax, education, health, safety, labor market policies, all these distort from a pure equilibrium, which we would never observe anyway. Um, and then how do you net out and isolate things like subsidies? Um, so I think um, there are some lessons to be learned from subsidy competition, particularly when we look back at agricultural subsidies. It's what I cut my teeth on when I came out of graduate school, looking at the Uruguay round and um, agricultural subsidies. And the whole idea of reducing agricultural subsidies was to reduce the sort of uh, competition between the US and EU, where we were spending each other into the ground, lowering global prices by increasing production and subsidizing it, causing prices to fall even further, requiring more subsidies. And the idea was to get a truce and with uh, try to limit the negative effects of those kinds of policies. Um, and I wonder if uh, future US-China tensions could be more about subsidy competition rather than um, just uh, straightforward commercial competition. What will be the role of the WTO and rules in this new environment? Um, I think well, I'll, I'll spend a few minutes here because I think uh, just a couple of minutes and then I'll stop because I've been talking for a while. If we're going to get reform at the WTO, 164 WTO members need to agree on something because there's a consensus. That's really hard. There's this thing called the G20, the group of 20 large countries. They often provide a political impetus to reform at the WTO. The big challenge with these countries is that 
they can agree on these kinds of things, at least the words, we agree the rule of law is important, transparency is important, how they interpret those rules may be different. So you get to that constructive ambiguity. But one of the interesting things here is that many countries stress that market-oriented policies is a principle of the WTO. Not all of them. So in the G20, many members, it says most because um, most members are European, most G20 members are from Europe or the United States or Canada or Australia. Um, but some countries question whether or not market-oriented policies are a fundamental principle. And if you can't agree that those kinds of things, what, what's your fundamental principles of the multilateral trading system is, it makes it difficult to reform that. So this is gonna be a challenge for the WTO and members trying to get, you know, make sure they have a common understanding of what these words mean, and then developing some sort of understanding around things like market-oriented policies. Okay, I think I'll stop there. I've been talking for a long time. Uh, it is late here and my throat is sore. So I'll open it up for questions. Should I stop sharing my slides, John? Yeah, that'd be great, actually. Okay. All right. So thanks, Bob. This is that was really very interesting. Are, are you willing to stick around? Just so I know it's late, a little bit longer. Just yeah, I can to... stick around for yeah for a while to answer. Some okay, questions. so so I mean, um, because there's a lot of people that have really interesting questions, but I just want to ask one quick thing, just because you mentioned about um, the WTO and failure to reach an agreement, like a broad level agreement, how difficult it is, and I've seen um, some people describe it as they've used an analogy that it's like a parliament where the parliament has to decide on all issues in one bill and there has to be unanimous agreement. So is that a fair characterization? And then how optimistic are you that we can actually reduce barriers to trade globally, given that people can't even agree, agree on what market oriented policies are? <laughs> yeah. So um, consensus is the expect is, is the rule at the WTO. So um, even to adopt a, an agenda for a committee meeting, um, you expect consensus. And consensus usually is the absence of opposition. Um, and the problem comes, I, I actually try to avoid the word or that phrase, the problem is. But anyway, uh, the challenge is that um, increasingly some countries have been using opposition to prevent discussions from moving forward. Um, and there's a debate. Does every decision have to be a consensus decision? Does simple opposition prevent even like-minded countries from having conversations? And what we see right now, John, are these things what we call joint statement initiatives, which are, um, they, they really came to fruition a couple of years ago at our, um, um, uh, geez, now I'm forgetting the name of this city in Argentina. It's that in Buenos Aires. Thank you. It's such a hard, hard city to remember. Um, where uh, a number of uh, issues were decided to be taken forward by groups of countries rather than everybody, and now some members are basically saying, "Well, you can't really have those discussions," but they haven't yet been able to block them, um, and that really goes back more towards what the GATT was about, which was group groups of countries coming together and deciding to take things forward. So I suspect that'll be some part of, of a future reform. But there, there, there are other things where all members do have to come together, whether we're talking about the appellate body. Um, and and I, I do think liberalization can continue. Um, you know, we get this natural technology reducing trade costs element, but there's also regional trade agreements. There's... Um, many other ways for countries to advance um, uh, liberalization and integration. Right, yeah, good. So, so I'll get to the questions because we have a lot of them. So, so we have a student uh, from NDSU that's asking, how does one get involved or educated in international trade? And they say that your average farmer does not participate in international trade, right. but knows it directly affects them on a daily basis over the long term. So 
How can we get involved for our benefit and the benefit of those around us in international trade issues? Well, I think, um, you know, making sure you um, follow the issues in the news, I think that's a, an important thing. If you read in a magazine like The Economist, that's a good way to keep up. They have a, a pretty strong focus on trade. Um, of course, um, you know, taking classes on international trade is a good thing to do, international political economy. Um, but I think it's, it, trade is something that makes the news a lot. And um, I think uh, you can keep up to speed on it um, pretty easily by following uh, the political and um, just economic debate. It's not just farmers, by the way, John, who have a hard time. Um, uh, re well, farmers recognize how important trade is because they export so much of what they produce. What's interesting is that many small and medium-sized enterprises export, but indirectly. They don't necessarily know that they export, but they participate in a domestic value chain. And often they're providing parts and components to a, a larger firm that does export. And so they may not even realize that 25% or 30% of their sales ends up going into the international market. Um, and that's something when I was with the USITC, I went around the country and tried to explain and show uh, just how dependent uh, you you could be on trade without even knowing it. Yeah, that, that's an excellent point. Because I, I think a lot of people like they they understand like when somebody's harmed by international trade, they see a factory closing or something. Everyone's concentrated in one area, but it's a lot more difficult to identify all the winners from trade because they're spread out so much over the economy. I think. So. And that is a natural political economy outcome. You know, Manker Olson and. All that good stuff, which is good, good courses to take to learn about uh, that kind of organization. Farmers, though, do tend to be relatively well organized, um, yeah, yeah. at least yeah. in large commercial crop farms. Yeah. Yeah. And thanks for mentioning Mansur Olson. He's a graduate of NDSU and an inspiration yeah. behind the Institute. So I didn't even pay you to say that. So thank you. Yeah. Uh, so so I, another question that somebody asks is, so to what extent do your forecasts account for the difficulty of finding available labor, including considerations uh, for inflationary concerns that will likely increase wages? Um, and then there's questions about the, the mitigation effects, uh, I mean, the mitigation packages that have been passed mm -hmm. and the ability for those packages to hinder people from being in the labor force and if that will what kind of effects that's going to have. Yeah, well, uh, I'm not a, a labor economist, but we do pay a fair amount of attention to labor impacts of trade. And once you start doing that, then you have to look at what other things affect labor markets. Um, and most of the literature these days seems to suggest, um, well, first of all, that uh, prior to COVID, for many, well, actually many years, including with the big bilateral trade deficits with China, we had relatively low employment in the United States. But what we had was a bifurcated market where some were doing well and some were not. But you could generally find a job, but it may not have been a very well-paying job. And that had to do with um, a couple of things. Some of it, many people would argue that it was trade and trade definitely had an impact. But um, I would say that the biggest, um, driver of those labor market outcomes was technology biased, um, well, sorry, uh, skill biased technological change where um, people with the right kinds of skills could do very, very well in the labor market. And if you didn't have those kinds of skills, a lot of the medium skilled jobs got hollowed out, not just manufacturing jobs, by the way. Um, I know when I was in high school, John, many of my classmates were taking bookkeeping classes because they were going to be bookkeepers, okay? A non-tradable service um, that has been completely decimated by software. Um, and that's happened to many, many kinds of employment categories. When you look out there, you see that many have been replaced either by software, um, whether it's traded or not traded or automation. Um, and that's been a constant throughout history um, particularly when you look from, you know, the first um, cropping in agriculture that generated a lot of technological change, 
through the industrialization of agriculture to the shift to industrialization and servicification, um, the, the, the biggest challenge has been to make sure that uh, the gains from all of that innovation are equitably distributed. And there have been many times in history where they've not been, and that usually causes social upheaval um, and um, a lot of unhappiness. But uh, one interesting thing in the labor market uh, studies has been, well, there are two interesting things. Generally, immigration does not reduce wages, does not reduce employment. It tends to increase employment and it doesn't seem to have much of an effect one way or the other on wages. Um, and then minimum wages, which most recent research suggests does not necessarily increase unemployment. But then there's the question, does the increased benefits prevent people from entering the workforce? Um, and I can't answer that question. Um, um, you know, I have some family members that are not in the workforce. They haven't been in the workforce for a while. And um, I don't know why. Um, yeah. Their lives aren't great, by the way. But, yeah. yeah, so, so uh, I was also, when I was in high school, people were being bookkeepers as well. So the bunch of the students are wondering what's a bookkeeper, but anyway, <laughs> that tells you how old we are. But, but kind of anyway. like an accountant. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, a junior so anyway, accountant. So another question, and I and we'll limit it just for a few more minutes. So we'll lift, we'll just for everyone in the audience, we're going to limit it till a quarter after because it's quarter after eleven there. So anyway, so so can you talk a little bit about the U.S. dollar as a reserve currency mm -hmm. and the short term? and long-term effects for the domestic and global economy of taking on national debt and printing money. So the concern is, is about you know, the inflation and, and US taking on debt. Yeah, so um, it does not seem like debt has the same adverse impacts right now that it seemed to hold for countries, say, in the 70s and 80s, um, and for foreign countries into the 90s. Um, and it'd probably be better to talk to somebody from the IMF or the Fed on that. I've got opinions, but they're not anywhere near as well as informed as the other things. I, I do, I can say something because it does matter for trade quite a bit about the dollar. So the dollar is both a blessing and a curse for the United States. Um, often, if, um, if your currency is strong, it's going to uh, make your exports expensive and imports relatively inexpensive. And if your currency weakens, it does the opposite, right? And the problem with the United States is that so many transactions in the global economy um, occur in dollars. And so many countries need those dollars to do those transactions um, that when the dollar value may change against another currency, it doesn't necessarily have the same kind of impact on the US competitiveness because those other, the, the prices for all the goods these other countries are producing are, are also in dollars. Yeah. So this, um, the, the ability of the U.S. currency to help with current account imbalances is limited compared to, say, if you're, you're selling in Turkish lira or Mexican pesos, um, there your currency will adjust, or, or the Australian dollar, uh, which fluctuates quite a bit and does have very big impacts on its competitiveness. But... Um, so that, that, that is a problem. Now, it can go into debt when other countries have their debt uh, uh, denominated in dollars. We, we don't suffer. But uh, if you're in Mexico and you have dollar debt um, and your currency weakens, suddenly things get very bad for you in terms of trying to pay back your debt. So that's some of the spillover effects from any kind of uh, Fed withdrawal from quantitative easing. Could have some pretty negative effects on other countries or the dollar movement. But um, the main thing from a trade perspective is, of, is it prevents this currency channel from helping to um, uh, reduce current account imbalances. OK, 
Okay, so so now we'll we'll limit it to one last question that from the audience because again, just everyone keep in mind that it's ten after eleven <laughs> for Bob. Uh, so so what do you believe will be the long term effects of unilateral border closures caused by the pandemic, such as the closed border between the United States and Canada? Well, I I I don't think they'll be long term. Um, I I think. As I said, there's been a lot of mitigation efforts. Uh, they've differed in the United States from state to state. They differ across borders, but I suspect that uh, this is gonna be a big lesson learned and you already hear discussions about um, vaccine passports or you know, critical worker passports. I see that, I live near the border in France. Um, I live in Switzerland, but people come from France to work in Switzerland and they get uh, these little passes that allow them to come across on a daily basis. They just put it on their dashboard and they they can drive through. Um, so I, I think there'll be mitigating um, policy developments that will will limit this. It, it, it has to because if 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 we, if we go back to a much more fragmented um, isolationist economy, you'll find out just how much you miss globalization because everything will get much more expensive. Um, you'll have far less variety to choose from. Um, and I think you'll see fewer opportunities. Now, it may be good for some of those people who work in areas where we import a lot of the goods, um, but that'll be a relatively small share of the overall workforce. And frankly, firms are already thinking about automation. Um, believe it or not, humans are humans are good at things that involve. Um, oh, uh, I am getting tired. Um, sort of emotion and things like that, right? Um, yep. so but um, firms are interested in keeping production lines up and running and not have to worry about did somebody get hurt or did uh, did somebody not feel like coming in to work today? And, you know, society has to think about how it wants to deal with this evolving uh, automation environment that is likely to just get uh, more and more efficient. Um, didn't really answer the question, but maybe no, it's- that was, that, was a good, that was a great answer. So, yeah, no, so this has been a really great discussion. I really appreciate it. And um, what everyone in the audience is giving you a virtual round of applause, oh, <laughs> they, but you can't hear them, but thank you, but thank thank you, you. Is, is, is excellent. And I really, again, we really appreciate you staying up late with us and it was really great to hear your insights and this will be a great discussion that we can continue here and hopefully we'll get you to Fargo in person and sometime in the future. So. <laughs> Well, thanks, John. It's been my pleasure. And uh, you all have a good afternoon. I understand it's snowing there. Um, whereas I've got tulips in the backyard. So <laughs> <laughs> that sounds good. Well, thank okay. you. Have a good night. Thanks again. Good night. Thanks. Bye. Bye.